The following program is paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you. Welcome. We're so glad you're joining us today. We want you to know that no matter who you are, we love you, that God loves you, and we hope that if you're ever in Irvine, you'll come down to this church and worship with us. If you have kids, bring them. We'll teach them the things of God. And uh, Hannah and I would love to shake your hand or give you a hug or, or do whatever, pray with you. Friends, we're gonna say this creed together. Would you hold your hands out like this as a way of receiving? Let's say this together. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks, you can be seated. Well, we're in a series called Your Best is Yet to Come. And if you're doing life with Jesus, friend, let me tell you, that is true for you. It's true for you. It doesn't matter how sick you are, how old you are, how poor or broke you are. If you're doing life with the Lord, your best is yet to come. And we want to spend about four weeks believing this and instilling this, these promises that come from Scripture, that we are in this, this thing called eternal living in the kingdom of God, that no matter how dark and hard your life is getting, God will never leave you, never forsake you, never abandon you, and that the best is yet to come. First, we do have to believe anything is actually possible. That is really true. If you have your Bibles, you can open with me to John chapter 14. John 14, Jesus says, this is a part of the departure sermon. And this is something Jesus needs his disciples to understand. It's kind of like the last thing he's telling them before the crucifixion. And he's talking to Philip. And he says, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. What works is he talking about there? He's talking about signs and wonders. He's talking about his miracles. This is important, that he begins, he's talking about walking on water, he's talking about raising the dead, he's talking about healing people. And then he says, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. So anyone who believes in Jesus can do those signs and wonders and more. And they will do even greater things. Everyone say greater things. Greater things. Look, if I, if I you know, pulled you over on the side of the road and said, can you do greater things than Jesus Christ? What would your answer be? No, right? But what would Jesus' answer be? Yes. This is so important. This is so, how often is Jesus looking at his disciples and saying, you little faiths? It was his like, Nickname for his disciples. He was just constantly trying to build their faith, build their faith, build their faith that they're not living in the kingdom of the earth anymore. They're living in the kingdom of God where anything is possible in their life. Anything. Pastors who teach that miracles don't happen anymore are pastors who have not seen what I have seen. I, I have prayed for a man in Thailand who couldn't walk for 10 years and he stood up and ran. We prayed for a woman who had a tumor on her neck and the tumor vanished. We went to a town where it hadn't rained for three months and we prayed for rain and it started raining as we prayed. I watched a girl who had white pants on on a missionary trip, was leading a bunch of teenagers. She was hit by a car going about 60 miles an hour, flung through the road, tumbled on the ground in Bangkok, got up, was totally fine and her pants weren't dirty. So I want to tell you something. Look, miracles happen. They just, for whatever reason, don't happen as much in the U.S. <laughs> I 
You can speculate why, but I'm telling you, I'm telling you that anything is possible in your life. You can be healed of anything. Anything can happen in your life. Anything can change in your life. You can beat your addiction. You can save your marriage. You can recoup your kids. You can bring your family back together. You can start your own business. You can do anything, anything, if you do it in Jesus' name. And the thing is, that this is one of the main things that Jesus is trying to get across to his disciples. Believe it, first of all. Believe and fall in love with possibility. Fall in love with the what-if motif. Now, God doesn't always heal us, right? He's sovereign. God doesn't, we don't always get what we want, but it's always possible. And if we can wake up every morning and ask ourselves that question, what if? What if this could happen in my life? What if this was possible? And begin to live from that place. I believe that incredible things will begin to happen in your life. The danger, of course, though, is that when we do become possibility thinkers, we do embrace faith, we do embrace the kingdom of God, we do believe in miracles, that God can change even physics and bend the rules if he wants to, that the danger is the the danger of denial. I've seen this sometimes in many charismatic circles, which I've been very much a part of. It's it's the, the pendulum on the other side, and it can be a danger. I remember... Once a friend of mine was talking about, you know, he grew up in a poor family, and um, we were very good friends, and, and he was saying how, you know, he lived with his mom, and they were, they were a Christian family, and they very often didn't have much. Sometimes they'd go to bed hungry, or you knew things were bad because they would have potato soup, you know, every night for, for nights in a row, or pancakes or something. And he was talking about how one day his mom was watching TV, and it was a lottery commercial. And on the lottery commercial, at the very end, there was like a cartoon $100 bill, and it said, anyone can win. And then Benjamin Franklin, in the dollar bill, looks through and goes, even you, Karen. (laughs) And she believed that was the Holy Spirit. She said, I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit like came through the TV and spoke to me that I would win the lottery. So, so they really believed that they were gonna you know, win the lottery, and so she went out and bought five tickets. And I know what you're thinking. If you're guaranteed that you're gonna win, why would you buy five? Just get one. <laughs> Just because you're a millionaire doesn't mean you throw away four dollars, all right? I don't know if you're hedging your bets. And, uh, and they lost. And later on, he was saying how he found out that that was a, like a, a thing that the lottery was doing. They took like the top 20 names of lottery players and would tag their name on the end, you know, in the hopes that they would do, you know, something like that. The good news is later on, she she did very well in uh, in real estate and created a business, but it was only after she paid the price. It was after she, she did the hard work. She got the dream in her mind and it took her years and difficult work and getting licensed and all the stuff, but she got there, but it didn't fall in her lap. It came through the struggle and the struggle itself helped her experience God in an even more real and profound way. Look, I want you to know anything is possible in your life. Jesus said it. Jesus said, anything, anything, anything is possible to them who believe. Those who believe in me will not only do the works I have been doing, but greater works. Anything they ask in my name, it will be given to them. But he also said, take up your cross and follow me. Look, anything is possible, but there is a price There is a price, and you have to be willing to pay that price to see those possibilities become real in your life. And very often, that price is a lifelong struggle for that thing. But I believe that that struggle is worth it, worth it, worth it, worth it. Be the one warrior. Be the one warrior that's willing to pay the price to to be that one guy that makes, or that one woman who makes all all the difference. You can be that person. Funny story, in Germany, back at the, in the 7th century, they believed that Germany was unconquerable for the gospel. And so there was this, there was this guy, and there's versions of the story, and I've never gotten to the bottom of it, but most of Europe had been Christian at this time, by the you know, 700s, so 7th and 8th century. And there was a guy named Boniface. And one story says that he was excited because the Pope wanted to Uh, launch missionaries into Germany and really go for it. But another version of the story says the opposite, that Boniface actually, who was English and was a a priest and a missionary, went to Rome to study under the Pope and hoping that he'd become a professor. 
Now just picture yourself, you know, you're English and you grew up in England and you go to Rome and you're eating pasta <laughs> and you're having wine, you know, priests can drink wine, you know, good wine. And uh, you're hanging out with the Pope and you're teaching. And the Pope says to Boniface, Germany needs the gospel, you're gonna go. And Boniface, for whatever reason, this is my favorite version of the story, is so angry, he's like, I'm just gonna go and die. I'm just gonna go and die a martyr. So he walks into the center of Germany to the Druid warriors, and he goes to like the heart of their country and culture, to this place called the Great Oak of Thor. And this is like a giant world tree, picture a thousand, 2,000 year old tree, and just as he's walking in, he's like, hasn't quite figured out how he's gonna martyr himself yet, but as he's walking in, he sees these Druids do a child sacrifice on the tree of Thor. And the guy, so appalled, grabs an ax and starts walking down unannounced. Nobody knows who this guy is. He's dressed like a priest with an ax over his shoulder, walks into the middle of town and just starts chopping down the tree of Thor. Chops it down to the ground, turns it into a pulpit, gets on top and starts preaching the gospel to these people thinking he'd be martyred. Little did he know the greatest uh, virtue in their, in their culture was courage. And so they see this guy do this amazing thing and, and actually they all came to faith and were baptized that day. See, another cool part about that story is as he starts chopping, you know, Thor is the god of thunder and wind and all this stuff, and as he starts chopping, the wind starts to blow and a storm starts to, this is how the legend goes, and they all think, oh, Thor's coming down, is gonna mess this guy up, right? And instead, the wind like finishes the job and knocks the tree down. And then of course, Boniface takes the tree and turn, uses the lumber to turn it into a church. And the reason I like that story is everybody thought it was impossible to get the gospel uh, into Germany. It took a man who was willing to die to give everything to see what everybody said was impossible to be possible. Some things are actually worth dying for, friends. Some things really are. Some things are really worth suffering for. Some things really are worth the sacrifice. And we believe that this eternal life that we've been given, when we pay that price, we will look back and know it was worth it every time. You wanna do amazing things for the Lord? You can do anything, you can do anything. Anything is possible in your life. But just know, it comes with a price tag. And that price tag is worth paying every time. This is what Jesus means when he's talking about the narrow road. Let me ask you a question. It's a language question. How much is a few? Well, let me, how, let me ask you, how much is a couple? Two, all right. How much is a few? Three, four, five. Is nine a few? Probably not. Maybe if there's thousands of, of it. There's no right answer, by the way. I Googled it. <laughs> a few is a few. That's what it is. All right, just remember, look for that word, okay? A few. Just look for it when we read. Jesus says, Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And... Everybody say many. many. Many enter through it. Many, many, many. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life. And only a, only a few find it. Now, I just want to clarify, I don't think the life he's talking about here is going to heaven. It's easy to see that. He might be. He might be talking about eternal life. But the life he's talking about, Zoe, it's life, full life. It's life in the kingdom of God. It's the kind of life that Jesus is living every single day and is trying to get his disciples to embrace. It's life in the kingdom of God, a miracle kind of life. A life that's overflowing with purpose and joy and passion and pur I already said purpose. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, you know. Life, Feel being alive, feeling alive. And he says here that the way to that life is a narrow road that only a few find. If you want a really rich, 
awesome, fulfilling life. Embrace the struggle. Even seek the struggle. Don't run away from it because whatever stands between you and all of the possibilities in your life is a struggle that's gonna make you an even better version of yourself. When we go through the struggles, Christ within us is glorified. The, the power of Christ materializes and we see he really hasn't abandoned us. He really can do anything in our lives, amen? I recently heard an interview, amazing interview that is not suitable for work, lots of the F word. Don't worry, I've already listened to it for you. <laughs> I've shielded your virgin ears from the F word. <laughs> I'm being facetious, you guys hear the F word all the time. <laughs> they act like I don't know. <laughs> oh, okay, you don't, you don't watch movies? All right, I'm digging a hole I can't get out of. So, uh, this, amazing, this amazing interview uh, with Joe Rogan, who's a comedian on podcast, with a guy named David Goggins. You don't know the name probably. David Goggins was or is an African-American man who grew up in an all-black community. His dad was uh, abusive. His dad was a criminal, um, stole, I think he dealt drugs. Really abusive to his mom. Would beat her up all the time, and then David would try and fight his dad. He tells a story of one time his dad beat up his mom and then dragged her down the stairs by her hair. His dad always saw the worst in him, always treated him like garbage. One day, his mom finally got the courage to leave the dad, and they moved to a very small tent of 10,000 white people in Indiana. And the reason I say white people is because he was the only black family in this very small community. On the second, I think it was the second week they were there, they had a parade, and it was like, you know, the American Legion, and then it was like, you know, Mothers Against Drinking, and then it was the Ku Klux Klan. The Ku Klux Klan marched in the town's parade. So this poor kid, as a teenager, was called the N-word almost every day, was bullied and ostracized. He had health problems that he faced. And fast forward to 24 years old. Here's a David Goggins, who is living in a poor part of town, a one-bedroom apartment. He's making a thousand bucks a month, and his rent is eight fifty a month. And he's an exterminator, and he weighs three hundred pounds. And he's just doing life, and he's depressed, and doesn't know what he wants to do with his life. And one day, he sees on the Discovery Channel a show about Navy SEALs, and he says, he asks that question, that "what if" question. He looks at it and thought, "What if a guy like me?" who, by the way, he was terrified of water and swimming. Terrified, like he would like, if he had to get in water, he'd like be up all night thinking about it. He's like, what if a guy like me, who weighs 300 pounds and makes no money, and who, you know, hates water and, you know, out of shape, could become a Navy SEAL? So he goes down and he starts calling recruiters and they say, you, you don't meet the physical, you know, limitations to be, you know, to be in this branch of the military. And, and finally, one guy says, well, maybe you can make the reserve. So he goes to a reservist, and the reserve says, we'll let you in, but you have to weigh 190 pounds, and you've only got three months um, till the qualifiers come. And he just said, forget that. I can't, I can't lose, whatever, over 100 pounds in three months and, and make these qualifiers. So he says the next day, you know, he was an exterminator, and he was at a... I can't say the name of the restaurant, but it is a seafood restaurant that serves red lobsters. <laughs> so he's there, and he said he's at like some, some part of the restaurant, and he said he didn't, hate, he didn't like cockroaches much, you know, and he hit the mother load. He said, the mother load of cockroaches, and then there were rats as well. And he was standing there with him, you know, as himself, and he said something, he's like, he just looked at all of this, and he said, this is my life. This is my life. Nobody's coming to help me. Nobody's coming to save me. This is my life. 
And he said something snapped. He left his exterminator thing and his van and everything, and he said he just started training like crazy. He, he would run, he would get on his bike. One of the things he had to train was his mind because he was so afraid of water. When he was too exhausted to exercise, he would just go like sit in the pool to try and get over the fear of water. And he just did this. He said, what, what happened to me was like, anything that was horrible, anything that sounded awful, he's like, if I, if I saw something and imagined that would be absolutely horrible to do, he's like, I just do it. I just do it. I just realized if I was gonna get a better life for myself, I had to love what was horrible. He's like, so if I was looking outside and it was like three in the morning and it's snowing and I would think, oh, it would be horrible to run in that. He's like, I would just get out of bed and go running. And it was this type of thing. Guess what? He became a Navy SEAL. He's the only guy to go through three hell weeks in one year. One of the guys in the hell weeks died. I mean, it's that horrible. Hell week is that horrible. And he just continues to this day to live this philosophy. When, when he was a SEAL in 2005, a bunch of his... Um, mates died in a helicopter accident in, in Iraq. He did several tours in Iraq and Afghanistan as a SEAL, and he felt so bad for these families that he wanted to run the Moab 240. Now, the Mo Moab 240 is a run, I believe it goes through Death Valley. It's 240 miles of running. He'd never done a marathon in his life. And the, the guy at the, the, who allows people to run said, I'll let you do this, but you have to qualify, and the qualifier is in five days, and it's a 100 miler. He was like, I'll do it. Now again, he said he'd never run more than 10 miles in one thing ever in his life. And so he and his wife, they go to Walmart and they buy a lawn chair and some Myoplex and Ritz crackers. And he gets out there and he starts, he thinks I can do 100 miles. By mile 70, which is still a lot. I mean, that's, what is that, three, uh, almost th uh, mar three marathons? I couldn't remember the word marathon. <laughs> it's morning, guys. What is that, three marathons, right? So he, he uh, at mile 70, he's completely out of energy. He falls into the lawn chair, and he, he can't reach the bathroom. He sees like three of his girlfriend. He, I don't know if I can even say this, he soils his pants in the lawn chair, urinates blood, and she's like, we gotta get you to a hospital right now. And he just looks at her and he's like, no! So he gets out of the lawn chair. I'm not recommending you do this, by the way. He gets out of the lawn chair and begins to just hobble around. She's like trying to help him. And, he, and she's like, you're not gonna make this. And he said, something happened at mile 81. Some, he said, something in my spirit, and my mind, and my body just snapped. And all of a sudden, I finished from mile 81 to mile 100 at a 10 minute pace. <laughs> and he qualified. Then he qualified for the Boston Marathon a week later. And now he runs about 400 miles a week. He set the record for pull-ups, 4,030 pull-ups. Look, all of this to say, when I listen to this, when I listen to this interview, I recognize, I said a prayer for this man. And I said, Lord, I pray that David Goggins would know you. Because if this man knows the gospel of Jesus Christ, and applies this kind of passion and this kind of understanding of the value of the struggle to his faith. Think about what he could do for the gospel. Think about what he could do. Imagine he applied that to his family. Imagine he applied that kind of passion and sacrifice to his kids, to his church, to people suffering in his city. Imagine he applied that kind of passion and willingness to suffer. This man would be a history maker and a miracle worker. And friends, I want you to know, anyone can be that way. Anyone can be that way. Anyone can not only believe that anything is possible, but anyone can also take up the cross and follow the Lord to victory. I want you to know that God wants to do great things in your life, but I will not bait and switch you and promise that you're gonna win the lottery. I will promise you that if you're willing to pay the price, you're gonna do amazing things in your life. And no matter how old you are, no matter how unhealthy or sick you are, no matter how broken your family is, or broken your relationships are, or broken your ministry or business is, God's not done with you. Your best is yet to come, but don't run away. 
from the narrow path that leads to life and victory. Amen. Lord, we love you and we thank you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you love us and that you're not going to let us uh, you're not going to let us lose our passion or our dreams or the visions or the things that you've given for us. You, you want us to fulfill incredible things with our lives. And so we just pray, Father, that you give us a drive and a desire to walk the narrow path uh, so that we can do great things for the kingdom of God. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us for Hour of Power today. We hope that you found incredible hope and inspiration from this program. Earlier this year, we went through a message series called DIY, No One Can Follow Jesus For You. This series was designed to give you the basics of Christianity, like becoming a Christian, or how to pray, or how to read your Bible. We're so passionate about helping you in your faith walk that we've designed a guidebook called DIY, Build Your Faith which can lead you to build your faith with God, with yourself, and know Him more deeply than ever. Life is full of chaos and confusion, and often seems that there are more questions than answers. This book is designed to be a resource that you can turn to again and again as you build a life that is securely rooted in Jesus. Each chapter contains practical steps to take and answers questions you may have as you work to construct a solid foundation with Jesus. You know, becoming a Christian is the most important and one of the best decisions you can make in your life. Hannah and I wanna help you build and strengthen your faith by using these spiritual disciplines. Take a moment and request this valuable resource today. Call, write, or go online today and request DIY, Build Your Faith. Based on Bobby's message series, this book includes practical steps you can take in your Christian walk or to aid people you love in theirs. This would be a great book to give the new believers in your life. Each chapter contains the where, what, who, when, why, and how of different aspects of the Christian faith. Chapters include becoming a Christian, letting go of the past, and memorizing scripture. You have the power to build a faith that is more vibrant and powerful than you ever imagined. So call, write, or go online today and request DIY, Build Your Faith. Along with this guidebook, we'll include our DIY Toolkit keychain. Complete with a hammer, ruler, cross, and a Build Your Faith plaque, this keychain is a fun addition to our DIY Build Your Faith book and will be a constant reminder of how you can do the impossible with Jesus. Call, write, or go online today and request DIY Build Your Faith book and DIY toolkit keychain. We're asking a gift of $50. Your generous support allows us to share the message of God's love with the world, and we ask that you prayerfully consider partnering with us as we do ministry together. Thank you, and remember always, God loves you, and so do we. The preceding program was paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you, and is accredited by the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability.